Akira is one hell of a movie. And I'm not just saying that because it's one of the most iconic films in the cyberpunk genre. Having around a $10 million budget when it was released in 1987 made it for a while the most expensive anime film. And with that budget, it allowed it to do many new unconventional things that would make it the classic we know today. Using pre-scored dialogue, which is recording voiceover first and animating to match it, and having incredibly detailed hand-painted backgrounds. Even after releasing, it was huge in the West showing that animation wasn't just for kids, as well as showing there was interest in anime outside of Japan. While the film didn't adapt the original material exactly, it being directed by Katsuhiro Otomo, the creator of Akira, made the film actually stand besides the manga, giving the franchise an overall name a resonance that would last more than 30 years. Looking at everything it's done, it being an icon of its genre and medium, if anything, is the cherry on top of it all. So of course, a film with this type of recognition, the idea for a live action version has been in the works, but nothing's ever come of it, which is what I want to look into today. The long history of the Akira movie that we never saw. The talk for a live-action Akira actually dates back to the early 90s. Sony looked into adapting for the big screen after its Western debut and success in 1989. They wanted to take advantage of the conversation around the film at the time, but would later scrap the entire idea when the projected budget for the film crossed over 300 million US dollars. After that, the rights for a live-action version would be picked up by Warner Brothers in 2002, and ever since then they have been trying to get the film made. The first ones to attempt it would be Steven Norrington and James Robinson as director and screenwriter, but let's look into them. The director was an odd choice when you see his previous projects. All his films had low to mediocre scores, so why was he chosen? Well, he was still coming off Blade in 1998. While it didn't have the best scores, it was a massive financial success with a budget of $45 million. It made almost three times that at the box office. During this time, movies based on comics were in this dry spot due to some bad ones happening beforehand, ruining the idea that these type of movies could be successful until until Blade happened. So it made sense to get the guy behind a really successful and recent movie based on a comic to adapt another piece of entertainment based on a comic to the big screen. The next best thing would be to get someone familiar with comics to write it, which is where James Robinson comes in. He's a writer who's worked for both DC and Marvel, but also screen wrote smaller films. This was all happening in 2002. By this time, the ripples of Blade's success would be showing having a well-received and profitable X-Men film in 2000, and later in 2002, Sam Raimi's now iconic Spider-Man. So it was a perfect time to adapt Akira. In the original announcement, Norrington actually hinted that in this version, some changes were being made. He said that it preserves the tone, the visuals, and the epic scope of the original while telling a somewhat more accessible story to Western audiences. One of those changes was to make Kaneda and Tetsuo brothers. Akira was supposed to start production after his next comic to film adaptation, which was League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which also had the same screenwriter, but the movie being a massive financial and critical failure put the plans for Akira on hold. Norrington would later leave the project, possibly forced out, and filmmaking altogether. The film would be on hold for six years due to Warner Brothers letting go of the license during this time, but they would later reacquire it in a bidding war that would cost them seven figures. So WB actually doubled down on the live-action Akira and started plans for it immediately in 2008. That's when Ruari Robinson announced that he was directing this Gary Wooda as the screenwriter. These two were also an interesting choice. Robinson was mainly known for making sci-fi short films and animation. His 2001 short 50% Grey was even nominated for an Academy Award. While I understand why they chose him, being someone who only works on sci-fi movies, it's still crazy that they chose to give this massive property to someone who at the time didn't even make a full-length movie. Also, Gary Wooda was a bit questionable. In 2008, he had no screenwriting credits, so no one really knew the quality of his work when it came to film. While he didn't have movie credits, he did have some in video games. He was a writer for the original Prey, and as someone who's played that game, let me just say the story wasn't the reason people liked it. The other game was the original Gears of War, so at that time, he was 50-50 when it came to sci-fi stories. Since he didn't really have anything before 08, let's take a look at what he later worked on to get an idea of his quality. When it came to games, he was also a writer for Duke Nukem Forever, which there isn't really much to say for that one. Also, he co-wrote the story for Telltale's The Walking Dead Season 1 Episode 4, which debatably is the weakest part of the season. Going to movies, he was a writer on The Book of Eli, which had pretty mediocre scores, followed by After Earth, so not much to say about that one, with his biggest and most successful project that he co-wrote being Rogue One A Star Wars Story. But unlike the last plan, there Akira got farther into production so we can see what their vision for 
the movie would have been. This one had an all new script that actually wasn't based on the film but the manga and it would have been told across multiple movies if the first one did well. Wida thinks it would have either been a duology or a trilogy to tell the whole story and the script for the first part would have taken it up to the destruction of Neo Tokyo and the rebirth of Akira. Which leads to the next part. While he stated it was based on the manga, there was still some changes done to it to work for global audiences. The first one being the setting. It no longer took place in Tokyo, Japan, but Manhattan, New York. In a 2015 interview, Wida talked about the changes made and what their idea for the movie would have been. The setting change was covered stating that future Japan had been forced to deal with an economic and population boom by buying an abandoned Manhattan Island in a massive land deal from the American government, which itself had been driven close to economic ruin by the destruction of the city from the original Akira incident. With this it made Manhattan a Japanese territory called New Tokyo with a population of 10 million Japanese people. Wida and Robinson came up with this idea to allow them to change things while still being true to its Japanese origin. It would even allow them to have a mix of actors and avoid the claims that they were whitewashing it. Since this version of the film was getting far along into development even having a planned release year being 2009, there's actually a lot of concept art and storyboards from it, all officially released by Ruari on his website. While the setting change is something I'll get into later, I will say that based on the art, New York looks like it would have fit really well with the gritty neon vibe that is very prominent in Akira. The art also covers the Joker biker gang, Tetsuo's rampage through the city, a recreation of the iconic slide, the bike battle sequence, and some very realistic art, one even showing a before and after of transforming a real life city into Neo Tokyo. Aside from that, there's a bunch of storyboards that cover what would have been the opening shot for the film, Tetsuo's escape from the facility, the bike battle, Kanada's confrontation with Tetsuo, and the final sequence starting off in space, zooming into the earth, showing the wasteland of what was Neo Tokyo, then leading to the final shot of Tetsuo on his throne being worshipped like a god. The concept art even shows what they had in mind for the main duo. Many actors have been in talks to play the leads, but for this one it looks like Chris Evans was who they wanted to play Kanada and Joseph Gordon-Levitt to play Tetsuo. Rari would leave the project in 2009, pretty much ending this version of Akira. Aside from all the art, he also posted his original pitch video that he made in 2007. It uses footage from multiple movies to give a rough idea of what it would look and feel like, and at the end it shows actual test footage which I will admit looks cool to see parts of the film be brought to life. While the first cancellation put the movie on hold for a while, after this version, plans for a new one came pretty fast. In February 2010, Rari would be replaced with Alan and Albert Hughes, who apparently are known for making visceral and violent movies. In that sense, Akira is very much up their alley. But looking into their films, most of them got low scores and one of them is even The Book of Eli, which as mentioned earlier, Gary would a screen wrote. And speaking of him, this version of the movie actually used his script from his adaptation as a base and would then be modified by Mark Fergus and Hawk Ostby, the duo best known for screenwriting Children of Men and Marvel's Iron Man, which both are pretty good. Albert would end up having to solo the movie with Alan leaving the project in 2011. In an interview, he was asked if the movie would be rated R, and he said that WB mandated that it had to be PG-13. It was actually the first thing they told him. He pretty much said that it would be a big challenge due to the manga having so many heavy scenes, and that he was hoping by now someone would have figured out how to work with the ratings, since scripts have been in the works for such a long time. He did think of a solution, but it's something fans of the manga and anime may not like. I'll just read his quote. The trick for me is to simplify everything for the audience, because you can't come in with that complexity. Many are not going to be happy with that statement, but if you were in his position, you'd be having a hard time too trying to get the story to work with that rating. Something I find a little contradictory is that WB also mandated that no one could make a single movie based on the manga. It had to be two films, each covering three volumes, which seems true with Ruari and Wida fitting the same criteria. It's odd because they wanted it to be based on its source material, but they gave it a rating that goes against it. It gets even weirder. Hughes stated that he might not even return for the sequel if it was successful. He said, nah, I'm not into sequels, so I don't even know if I'm going to be around for the sequel. I'm going to focus on the first movie and get that right, and they can talk about that later. I don't know if I would do it though. That's crazy when it's an overarching story being told across two films. In 2011, a script of the movie leaked online. It's assumed this was either Witta's or a rough draft of Ferguson Otsby's, having the new Manhattan change, some not so subtle references to 9-11, also Canada and Tetsuo being brothers, which isn't the last time you'll see this, but something surprising is that that apparently they are in their early 30s. I'm not gonna go through the whole script because it will take forever, but those changes are only scratching the surface. It pretty much didn't even sound like Akira. 
A month later, casting calls were released. Zac Efron was in talks to be Canada, but it seems he was no longer being considered for it. Since he was out, the next person being eyed was Garrett Hedlund, who was coming off Tron Legacy. Robert Pattinson was in talks to be Tetsuo, but aside from him, Andrew Garfield and James McAvoy were also considered for the role. The other characters were getting casted as well. Kay officially went to Kristen Stewart, and the colonel went to Ken Watanabe. With these casting calls, the film was being called out for whitewashing. Aside from that, the casting call actually spoiled the plot. Canada was now a bar owner in Neo Manhattan, and Tetsuo is his brother who gets abducted by the government. Kanada joins Kay in her underground movement who are intent on revealing to the world what truly happened to New York City 30 years ago when it was destroyed. That's a brief segment from the synopsis that actually differs quite a lot from the leaked script, but this summary doesn't mean that this was the final version of the movie. Actors still could have been changed. During this time, Albert Hughes would leave Akira due to amicable creative differences. The differences being that Warner Brothers didn't approve the $180 million budget. They wanted many of their movies to have a lower budget budget at that time so they could be easier to profit, with three movies being put on hold to rework their scripts with that in mind. Those were Paradise Lost, Akira, and The Dark Tower which would eventually escape its production limbo with the movie releasing in 2017. There isn't much concept art, but from what there is, it was very stylish bursting with bright colors showing what would have been Neo Manhattan, as well as a female biker who I assume is Kay. The storyboards only show really brief moments. First one is the military going into the city, the second looks like a knocked out Kanada, while the third one looks like an interaction between Masaru and Kyoko. These are the only things to give us an idea of Albert Hughes' vision for the movie. Juan Colette Serra announced that he signed on to be the next director later that same year. He got the job because he was able to bring down the budget to 90 million, but even with that, WB wanted it even lower, preferably between 60 and 70 million dollars, which is what The Dark Tower had. Serra was known for a lot of horror and action thriller films, which was most likely another reason why he was chosen for Acura, but looking at everything he's made, his track record didn't seem that promising. As for the writers, many were being looked at to rewrite Sarah's script. Steve Cloves, known for his work on the Harry Potter franchise, wrote one at this point, but later Dante Harper, now known for Edge of Tomorrow and Alien Covenant, would take over. Other writers were considered, but none were officially confirmed to have been part of it. Warner Brothers ended up shutting down the production in 2012 for issues with casting, budget, and scripts. During this time, Sarah left the project because he was in high demand after the success of his movie, Unknown. He left to work on other films instead of just waiting for issues to be resolved. So with with him leaving, WB started looking for other directors who could work with the smaller budget that they wanted, but they liked Colette Serra's version the most, and in 2013 he was brought back to direct the movie due to him finding time in his schedule, as well as finding a new approach that would work with the budgetary restrictions from the studio. It's unknown if it would keep the previous budget planned, but based on his statement it seemed that it would be lower this time. He was starting production on Run All Night around this time. After that was done, Akira would begin in spring of 2014. Run All Night released in 2015. Afterwards, when Colette Serra was asked if Akira made any progress, he said, no, no, there's nothing. The reason was that he needed a break from directing because he filmed his last two movies back to back over the course of three years. Nonstop started filming in November of 2012 with Run All Night in October of 2013, so he was gonna hold off on any film for a while. It'd been so long since when he got the directing job that by 2015 he wasn't even sure if he was still part of it. Later that year, the studio resumed work on it, but this time Warner Brothers had no director. The showrunner for Daredevil Season 2 was the writer, which is something cause he has no writing experience. This unceremoniously put an end to kill that Sarah's version. His version was not going to be heavily based on the anime or manga like what came before. He was going to change a lot of things, primarily the characters, but had reasons for that. His reasons were, and I quote, Nobody's interesting in the anime. Tetsuo is interesting because weird crap happens to him, and Kanada is so two-dimensional. That's part of the Japanese culture. They never have strong characters. They're used as a way to move other philosophy forward. When looking at the storyboards and concept art, you can see that this film was very different, looking way less cyberpunk and not having the neon lights prominent in the original movie and having a grittier look to it. There's also a sketch that gives us an idea of what Masaru and Kanada would have looked like, and finally they even changed the design of the iconic bike, making it much smaller. Going to the storyboards, these aren't officially part of Colitzera's version, but when the 2012 production shut down, a couple months later, the artist Jeffrey Erico released storyboards of what would have been the opening sequence for the movie. Colitzera's version was actually the closest to being made. While I know many are not happy that each version was going to change things, Katsuhiro Otomo has made it clear to the ones working on it not to be afraid of changing anything. That he wanted to see an original and different interpretation, not just a straight up remake. And in June 2017, he said that he was basically done with Akira. As a manga and that if someone wants to do something new with Akira, then I'm mostly okay with it. Was the only condition that he can review and approve any scenario a writer might take for a live action film. 
While he is okay with making changes to his work, even changing one thing from it is difficult because every little thing in it serves a purpose. Going back to the setting change that survived every version of the script, the setting of the original aside from being a cool futuristic version of Tokyo had some legit weight due to it being post an explosion that destroyed it in 1988. It was culturally rooted in Japan's involvement in World War II, which is shown with all the military and chaos of the citizens in the city. It's something that adds a lot to Akira that would be gone if changed. Wida said he didn't think it was necessarily a Japanese story and it's somehow sacrilegious to set a new adaptation of it anywhere else. He continued with, I think many of the themes in that story are the ones that speak to the human condition and are therefore relevant anywhere in the world. If that weren't true, the original version would never have been a hit outside of Japan. I understand why he thinks that, but with its World War II influence, it allows us to get an idea of what the Japanese were feeling at a time when their worlds and lives were in chaos due to something they didn't know could happen. Another change that was kept the same each time was Tetsuo's name being changed to Trevor, which is even shown in the Joseph Gordon-Levitt art from earlier. I find that odd because Kanada and a couple other names like K stayed the same. There is no reason why it was decided to Americanize him, but not the others. I'm kinda glad the other versions didn't go into production, not because I'm against the changes, I'm a giant advocate for different interpretations of existing material, but mainly due to all the people chosen. None of the directors and most of the writers had a promising history. It never felt like WB was putting what was best for the film first, and that was before the budget restrictions. Akira is still in development, currently looking for a director. Jordan Peele was offered the job after Get Out's massive success, but he declined and currently Taika Waititi of What We Do in the Shadows and Thor Ragnarok fame is currently in talks. But but based on the history of this film, that doesn't mean anything. It looks like WB is looking into better people for the project than before, which is great. Akira has now been in development for 15 years. Will it ever come out? I honestly doubt that. In my opinion, I think WB should just leave it alone, but who knows? The movie almost did happen at one point, but we will have to wait and see if that time ever comes again.